It is good to not see as many of you tonight. <laughs> I think, well, it's one of two things. A lot of our people went to the fifth Sunday singing at Orchard Street, or they, we, they think we think that they're at the fifth Sunday singing at Orchard Street, and they're really just skipping tonight. I'll let you decide. The Bible is the story of God. And as we look at the story of God, we, we have to realize that the only way I can find contentment, happiness, my purpose is understanding my place in God's story. Jonathan continues to be the key person in this telling of God's story tonight. And it is the, it is the circumstance where uh, Jonathan and David have, they've kind of come up with a scheme. Saul is, is being a threat to David. He wants to kill David. And, and yet they're, they're not sure because sometimes he's penitent and, and sometimes he's angry. And, and so they come up with a plan to determine whether or not King Saul really intends to kill David. And this plan is, is that David will be hiding behind a rock out in a field. And Jonathan and his servant are going to go and they're going to do a little shooting practice, a little target practice with a bow and arrow. And, and the sign to David, if things are not well, the prearranged signal is after Jonathan shoots his arrows and he sends his servant to go retrieve them, if he says, look, the arrows are beyond you, that's a sign that King Saul indeed plans to kill David. And that brings us up to verse 24 of 1 Samuel 20. And I went back and forth trying to decide how much of this section that I needed to read. And so we're just going to we're just going to read the whole thing. I think we need to kind of hear this whole story uh, beginning in verse 24 of 1 Samuel 20. And it fills in the rest of the details to the story. It says, At the new moon, the king sat down to eat the meal. He sat as his usual place on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat facing him, and Abner took his place beside Saul. But David's place was empty. Saul did not say anything that day because he thought, Something unexpected has happened. He must be ceremonially unclean. Yes, that is it. He is unclean. However, the day after the new moon, the second day, David's place was still empty. And Saul asked his son, Jonathan, why didn't Jesse's son come to the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David asked for my permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, please let me go down because our clan is holding a sacrifice in the town and my brother has told me to be there. So now if you are pleased with me, let me go so I can see my brothers. That's why he didn't come to the king's table. Then Saul became angry with Jonathan and shouted, you son of, perverse, of a perverse and rebellious woman. Don't I know that you are siding with Jesse's son to your own shame and to the disgrace of your mother? Every day Jesse's son lives on earth, you and your kingship are not secure. Now send for him and bring him to me. He deserves to die. Jonathan answered his father back, Why is he to be killed? What has he done? Then Saul threw his spear at Jonathan to kill him. So he knew that his father was determined to kill David. He got up from the table in fierce anger and did not eat any food that second day of the new moon, for he was grieved because of his father's shameful behavior toward David. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for the appointed meeting with David. A small young man was with him. He said to the young man, Run and find the arrows I am shooting. 
As the young man ran, Jonathan shot an arrow beyond him. He came to the location of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, but Jonathan called to him and said, The arrow is beyond you, isn't it? Then Jonathan called to him, Hurry up and don't stop. Jonathan's young man picked up the arrow and returned to his master. He did not know anything, only Jonathan and David knew the arrangement. Then Jonathan gave his equipment to the young man who was with him and said, Go take it back to the city. When the young man had gone... David got up from the south side of the, of the stone easel, fell with his face to the ground, and bowed three times. Then he and Jonathan kissed each other and wept with each other, though David wept more. Jonathan then said to David, Go in the assurance the two of us pledged in the name of the Lord when we said, The Lord will be a witness between you and me and between my offspring and your offspring forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went into the city. As I finish reading that, I ask the question, why did Jonathan love David? This isn't the first time where this deep affection is shared between these two men. And, and here, David and Jonathan weep together. I'm assuming they've embraced one another and they've, they've kissed each other. And so there's this, this deep love that, that they have for each other. And I, I wonder why. Some people have said that this is evidence from Scripture of a same-sex relationship. Uh, has anybody heard that? And yeah. Leave it to a sex-saturated, permissively uh, indulgent culture to look at this and say this is a same-sex relationship. The truth is, is our society has gone so far down the immoral track that, that we can't see this for what it is. In an article that I read, an article by Mary Sykes Wiley, she wrote this article in Psychotherapy Networker. It's a, it's a magazine for me, uh, mental health workers. It's a great article because she tracks the route of our society's uh, departure from a fairly moral and modest society to what we are today. And she, she, she begins back in the 60s in the sexual revolution. But it, it, you know, it, it wasn't just the hippies, it was deeper than just the hippies. Uh, there was action being taken in the courts and it, it began, oddly enough, with, uh, with freedom of speech and uh, dealing with what is and isn't pornography. Um, certainly uh, dealing with... Uh, uh, sodomy laws in regards to uh, some of the, the state sodomy laws and, 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 and that practice. Um, she talks about the, uh, the change in marital, in, in marital laws to where um, uh, no-fault divorce began to be uh, uh, what was considered when it came to divorce, so adultery and morality could spread through that. Um, we, uh, we have seen the availability of pornography on the internet. Uh, we have allowed the schools to teach our kids about sexuality. And all of this together has gotten us to where we are. And if you just talk to somebody in our culture, uh, they would say, uh, we are no longer sexually 
oppressed or repressed anymore. We have freedom. We can do what we want. We can express ourselves in however we want. And so a society that is like that is going to look at this passage and miss what is there. As, uh, as uh, Mary Sykes Wiley presents her evidence, as she, as she goes through this, this list in this journey, she says, the totally open secret is that in our obsession with pop sexuality, we vastly overestimated the power of sexual acts while vastly underestimated the feelings associated with them arguably no less clueless how to reconcile the two than our parents or grandparents. So it's the idea that, that we've, uh, we've got it figured out today in regards to sexual freedom, and, and yet people are still lost, they're still struggling with uh, understanding how it really fits in our lives, and, and this indulgent sexualized culture is, is not happy is not content. It's not bringing what it promised. She said somehow emotional intimacy got thrown under the bus of liberation so that in the end we get neither. And that's just it. It's not just this uh, practice. Uh, sexuality is, is not uh, simply the same thing as eating a hamburger or, or, or watching a movie. There's something very deep to it and very profound and that was God's intent that, that it, there is an emotional attachment that takes place in sexual intimacy and to ignore it and just practice open sexuality with whoever and whatever is, is going to lead not to happiness. She said, perhaps we've all been sold a bill of goods. Perhaps. <laughs> the idea that once freed of the old restraints we will find sexual happiness. And I'm going to suggest that our society has not found sexual happiness. Scripture teaches that self-control is, is really the only thing that's going to bring any kind of fulfillment when it comes to sexual intimacy. And I want us to take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. And this is, a, this is a, an interesting passage. It's, it's a powerful passage. It's a passage that if you want to spend time teaching the people you have influence over regarding um, sexual intimacy... This passage needs to be on that list. If you're trying to understand what human sexuality is all about, this passage needs to be on your list of things to understand and to, to have in your mind uh, fixed what Scripture teaches about human sexuality. Chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians beginning in verse 3. For it is God's will... For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, so that each of you knows how to control his own body in sanctification and honor, not with lustful desires like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means that one must not transgress against and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses as we have also previously told and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to sanctification. Therefore, the person who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also gives you his Holy Spirit. This passage is interesting because if you, as you look a little bit deeper into it, you wonder, what is it? that he's talking about. Verse 3 is the reference, he, he says that you abstain from sexual immorality. What is that? What is sexual immorality? And I'm going to suggest that if we read on, we understand that sexual immorality is any sexual practice outside um, a marriage between a man and a woman. 
The next verse says, so that each of you knows how to control his own body. That's probably not a real great translation of this passage, of this verse. The, like, the word we would use for body is not here. It's really, it's, it's the word that's translated vessel. Vessel. So, the King James Version does translate it. If you have the King James, it says, each one of you should know how to possess his vessel. And, and again, that's kind of, that's a, almost a, a word-for-word -word literal translation, but what is that talking about there? What does that mean? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, gives us an idea. I'm sorry, verse 7 gives us an idea. And it's the same word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives with an understanding of their uh, weaker nature yet showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Okay, weaker nature, that is, um, it's literally in the Greek, it says weaker vessel. So it's that same word, vessel. So it seems like what Paul is saying, and this is consistent with Paul's teachings, that he is saying, so if we, if we went back to uh, 1 Thessalonians, We could retranslate that so that each of you knows how to um, um, so that each of you knows um, uh, how to uh, possess uh, his vessel, how to um, not possess his vessel, but act toward his vessel, talking about his wife. That each of you should know how to, uh, and, and should control their, this passion by the sexual relationship with your wife. So he's, he's talking about a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. And, and that is God's plan. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a contrast to and that's what he says, and not like the Gentiles who don't know God, that, that, we, uh, that we know how to, uh, so if we, if we kind of gave this uh, like a, a message type of translation, know how to have an appropriate intimate relationship with your wife in sanctification and honor. So, so there's, there's a respect, there's a, a, a sense of... Um, of holiness regarding this sexual relationship? Not with lustful desires, like the Gentiles who don't know God. That's God's plan. But that's not how our society sees it. And so when they look at stuff and they stumble on stuff in Scripture that fits their ideas, they, they miss the point. So... Why does Jonathan love David so much? What, is, what explains the strong bond that, that they have? Okay, so Marilyn said the love of God. I think that's probably true. <laughs> but I think that earlier on, when the army of Israel was lined up across from the armies of the Philistines. And Goliath comes out and taunts the armies of God. And, and the armies of Israel, they're, they're shaking in their boots and King Saul is sitting in his tent. And nobody's doing anything. And you know, those guys, some of them were saying, come on. 
We can take him. Wouldn't you have done that? I just would have bum rushed him, beat him down, and then moved right through the rest of their line. I, w I wouldn't. This, you beat me, and then you win. No way. I'm going. And it was probably some guys, if someone would have had the guts to lead them, would have followed them into the valley of the shadow of death. David was that man. And, and Jonathan saw everything. And what he saw was a man who trusted fully in the grace and power of God to win his battles. And he, he loved that man and he wanted to be like that man. Because he knows what a harsh, weak, indulgent, and perhaps feminized man looks like. Verses 27 to 34 of our text, we see an example of a harsh man when, and when, he, um, uh, when King Saul insults Jonathan, insults his mom, uh, uh, explodes in anger, tries to kill him. And we see here the, the example of a harsh man who in the face of personal defeat and crisis refuses to humble himself before God and his family. King Saul is a dominant and controlling man who's living in his weaknesses and he's not getting his way. And so when harsh, dominant, controlling men don't get their way, they lash out in anger. And they attack the people who are closest to them. And so Jonathan knows what that looks like. Uh, as I think about these descriptions, I think for myself, I used to be a weak and indulgent man. I used to just take care of myself and care about my own life and, and nobody else's. And indulgent meaning I would... I wouldn't be addicted, but I would give myself to whatever I wanted to, to, to gain, whatever I thought I would gain pleasure from. I was a weak and indulgent man. And then we have men who are feminized in our culture. These, these words, harsh, weak, indulgent, feminized, describe the different types of men who are going to inspire nobody to any good deed. I'm sure Jonathan saw these types of men in his time. But he saw something different in David. He saw a man who trusted God and empowered him to be able to live a faithful life and do what needed to be done. Jonathan had an opportunity then to change the path of his life, to become a chain breaker, to change from being, uh, from having a legacy of rebellion as it relates to God, to a legacy of faithfulness. In this passage in, in Acts chapter 17, uh, it, it, it puts, It puts change into perspective in regards to our own lives and how, how we should view our lives. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands, though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath in all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. So God has sovereignty and dominion over all creation. And he created everybody from one man. And from that one man... All of humanity spreads over the face of the earth, and, they, and he says they find, they find themselves in different places. Why does God do that? Why did God do that? He did this 
so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God put us where we are right now, right now, so that we would see what's real in life and see what's important in life so that we would reach out and, and, and find him, so that we would uh, uh, be able to, to realize that our position in life, whether good or bad, is a place where we have the opportunity to reach out and discover and find God. God is evident to all and approachable to all. And so once I realize that my life isn't some cosmic mistake, that God put me where I am to find him, it begins to change my life. Things begin to change in my life. I begin to understand this passage in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24. A man's steps are determined by the Lord, so how can any under, anyone understand his own way? Without God, you're not going to understand what life is all about. Without God... Life isn't going to make sense. Without God, uh, uh, having sexual control of your lives isn't going to make any sense. But when you find God and you find Him and follow what He teaches and seek Him out instead of your own view of what you think He should be, understanding that God directs our steps, that a man's steps are determined by God. We began to make the decision to make some changes in our lives. That we are going to break the chains that may be holding us back in life. And, and you may say, well, I don't know anything about chains. But if we look closely, maybe we can understand what it is that we're talking about. We all have chains of nature. And that's talking about the weaknesses that all humans have. Ben referred to it this morning as, as a weakness of the flesh. It's the struggle that we all have, uh, that kind of rebellious nature that is within us, to do things our own way, to be self-centered and self-determined, regardless of what anybody else says. This can create some chains in our lives. Chains of choices. This is sins that we commit uh, ourselves and the bondage that follows those sins that we have committed, the consequences to the choices we have made. And then chains from nurture, the hurtful examples that we may have experienced growing up, the lies that we were told, uh, the worldly traditions that come through our formative years, all of those can work together to create chains in our lives and, to, and can, um, can hold us back. Jonathan had an opportunity to change the direction of his life, to no longer be a man like his father, but to be a man like uh, we see who, uh, a man like David. Wouldn't you like to have been around him? Can, can you imagine if you saw him coming in a, into a coffee shop, into the Starbucks, you're sitting there having a cup of coffee or... I know, Len, you don't drink coffee, so maybe, I don't know, orange juice or something like that. And, and he comes in, and, hey, that's David. And, and then someone says, hey, are you? And he says, yeah, I'm the one that cut Goliath's head off. You know, just the, the confidence he would exude, the, uh, the power, the, uh, the purpose, the, the sense of direction in his life. And having on, having on your mind being uh, the most important thing in your life, uh, the things of God. Having the things of God as your priority. Becoming a chain breaker, breaker means to, to be that man of faith to the people around you. To be someone who exhibits the qualities of loyalty and devotion and, and trust. That if I'm going to be a chain breaker, it means I need to be that type of a person. Uh, being a chain breaker means I have to wake up 
if in my life things are going from bad to worse, that just might be your sign. Pray to be a chain breaker. We need to pray uh, for the insight about the chains that might be holding you. Uh, we need to pray for that person to come into your life. I've had many men who have come into my life who have been that person at different times and when, it, uh, when there were different needs in my life. I, I cared about that. It mattered to me that I had someone to be an example to me. And it, it seems like when you pray that prayer, God sends that person. Don't be afraid to show emotion and love that is befitting among men. And, you know, I guess this isn't just a, a men lesson, right? I mean, like, right, so good. I, I'm glad that's coming across there. Um, so um, in our culture, how do guys usually greet? It's kind of a handshake, yeah. So um, now um, sometimes I'll do the protected handshake, you know, with a hug. You uh, maybe uh, like do the, 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 the high five clasping, clasping and you pull them in and you give them a hug. You know, that's, that's a safe thing to do. The other night, I was at the Target in Puyallup and I saw Travis Metcalf. Travis Metcalf is... Ray and Wenda West's daughter, Crystal, she married Travis. And Travis is a very strong believer, a uh, very committed believer. Um, and, uh, and I saw him, and he was getting ready, and this was probably 8.30 at night. He's getting ready to have a Bible study with a young man that he had contacted somehow. So they're going to sit down there in the Starbucks at the Target, and, and they were... They were studying the Bible. And so I caught him before the Bible study started. And so we talked. I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. And, but I do have his picture on my door because his wife always sends us a Christmas card. So I remember what he looks like. And so that's why I saw him. And I, so I, I told Lenita I was going to go say hi to him. And we had a great, great short visit. And then when it came time to leave, I uh, extended my hand. And he pulled me in and gave me a bear hug. It's like he tricked me. And I hate it when people do that. Because, <laughs> like, I'm not necessarily a hugger by nature. But that felt special. There was something in that transaction that told me something about his respect and his care and and how he felt about me, and, and uh, so I just kind of was awkward, and I said, oh, yeah, okay, okay, and uh, so people do that sometimes. Don the Lord does that sometimes. He'll, he'll draw you into a hug when you're not, when you're not ready for it, so, but it's, it's important because to not be afraid to show emotion. It's, it's, it's not a gay thing. It's a masculine thing, and it's, it's desperately needed in our society. When, when pictures of gay men is, is all that, that we see in our culture, and you know, it, it, they are, man, they're, they're, they're coming with a vengeance uh, in regards to getting that displayed in our culture. We're, you know, we're here and, and deal with it. If that's the only picture that our guys see, of, of masculinity and the sharing of that emotion, they're going to lose out because they need something more. They need to know. And, and so until I couldn't get away with it anymore, I would kiss Keegan on the head because he got really tall, and so I had to work at that one. But, um, you know, and then after that, it was hugging, and then, you know, there was a period of time where you couldn't even do that. But I wanted him to know that there is a man in his life that thinks he has what it takes to be a man. And that is really what is behind that. I get to Micah, he don't care. He, he'll let you kiss him up. <clears throat> but you be careful if he tries to kiss you back because 
he slobbers a little bit, and it's kind of a mushy little kiss. I'm, I'm just warning you, okay? Don't be afraid to show emotion and love that is befitting among men today. And then, sisters, specifically, look for men like this. Look for men who want to break the chains in their own life, who are trying to live a lifestyle that is, that where the things in their lives are the things of God. The things that are important to them are the things that are important to God. Those are the men that you look for. Edify your man. You may be, uh, you may have a man in your house and, and, uh, and maybe, maybe he's not perfect. Uh, we're working on, uh, Jonathan and I are working on our mission statement. And one of the statements is uh, we, we want to uh, enable strong men uh, to, uh, you know, to be good fathers, good leaders in the church, or good husbands, good fathers, good leaders in the church, etc., and, um, and so we're, we're having this discussion. It, it might be more clear to say something like, um, to help men to be strong. But if you say something like, help strong men, you're edifying them. You are telling them what you think about who they are already. And that this ministry is just designed to take a strong man and make him a godly man. Does that make sense? That's what we're trying to do with that. And so we're edifying our men. We are wanting them to know that we, we think you're strong already. But you need to be connected to God and hone that strength. So, sisters, look for men who love the things of God. Edify your man. Uh, if he's not strong, you tell me strong and he'll become strong. And, and that as, as moms, grandmoms, raise men, the young men, to this ideal. Uh, help them to see this lesson from the life of Jonathan. That, that um, masculinity is, is released when masculinity is, is exemplified, is modeled. I see Jonathan as, as, as an example of what it means to be a new creation. I see in his life the example of someone who perhaps was going down a different path in his life, could have been uh, someone who ended up uh, in, a, in an angry, frustrated, uh, harsh uh, mindset and attitude, but he, but he changed. Something changed in his life. He, he became new, and he had a new direction and a new focus in his life. And, and I believe that's what Paul is trying to tell us in this passage, that um, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, The old has gone and the new has been replaced. And that newness begins. That, that newness begins when we are baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 talks about the fact that uh, as, as we are baptized, we are baptized into death and, and, and in order to become new. That the old person uh, is, is put to death and what results is somebody who is new. And so maybe this evening that is something that you need to consider for your own life. To, to make that step, step to become a new creation and, 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 and be um, motivated and convicted to throw off the chains of your old life. To become that chain breaker. If you already have been baptized, then you, you're kind of a superhero. Because you already have the forgiveness of sins. And so you already have a solution for the problems that exist in life. And for your own personal problems that exist in your life, you already have that solution. But you also have the empowerment that comes 
from the presence of the Holy Spirit. As we sing this song of encouragement and invitation, consider the type of person that God wants you to be. Let us stand and sing.